Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the MFA Financial Inc. First Quarter Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. And if you do have a question during the conference, please press 1, then 0 on your touchtone phone. You may remove yourself by repeating the 1, 0 command. If you should require assistance during the call, please press star, then 0. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I'd now like to turn the conference over to Hal Schwartz. Please go ahead. Thank you, operator, and good morning, everyone, and thank you for your patience while we resolve some technological issues on our end. Um, the information discussed on this conference call today may contain or refer to forward-looking statements regarding MFA Financial Inc., which reflect management's beliefs, expectations, and assumptions as to MFA's future performance and operations. When used, statements that are not historical in nature, including those containing words such as will, believe, ex expect, anticipate, estimate, should, could, would, or similar expressions, are intended to identify forward-looking statements. All forward-looking statements speak only as of the date on which they are made. These types of statements are subject to various known and unknown risks, uncertainties, assumptions, and other factors, including those described in MFA's annual report on Form 10-K for the year ended December 31, 2019, and other reports that it may file from time to time with the Securities and Exchange Commission. These risks, uncertainties, and other factors could cause MFA's actual results to differ materially from those projected, expressed, or implied in any forward-looking statements it makes. For additional information regarding MFA's use of forward-looking statements, please see the relevant disclosure in the press release announcing MFA's first quarter 2020 financial results. Thank you for your time. I would now like to turn the call over to MFA's CEO and President Craig Knudsen. Thank you, Hal. Uh, good morning, everyone. Little did I know that I would have to compete for airtime with Chairman Powell, who is testifying in the Senate at 10 a.m. I apologize for those of you who drew the short straw and got stuck on our call. I'd like to thank you for your interest in and welcome you to MFA Financial's first quarter 2020 financial results webcast. Also dialed in with me today are Steve Yared, our CFO, Goodmunder Christensen, and Brian Wilson, our co-chief investment officers, and other members of senior management. Our format this morning will be slightly different from our customary earnings call. We have an earnings presentation on our website <clears throat> and filed as part of an 8K filing this morning. But unlike our usual earnings calls, this deck will not scroll on the webcast and we will not follow the earnings deck page by page as we typically do. I encourage you to open the presentation as I will refer at times to various pages in the deck as I deliver prepared remarks before opening up the call to questions. Before we begin, I wanna give a shout out to our entire MFA team. The last three months have obviously been extremely challenging and made exponentially more so by the fact that all of our efforts have been remote. The company fully implemented our business continuity plan during the third week of March and successfully completely transitioned to a remote work environment to address the operating risks associated with the global COVID-19 pandemic. The effort and commitment displayed by our entire team over the last three months has been extraordinary and I've been humbled by their dedication. Before we discuss the first quarter of 2020 financial results, which frankly at this point seems like ancient history, I'd like to spend some time discussing what other important work streams have been taking place at MFA since March 23rd, and I think it will be obvious why we've been silent on so many of these activities. These critical efforts have been comprised primarily of three things. One, forbearance, two, balance sheet and liquidity management, and three, sourcing third-party capital. We have issued several press releases chronicling forbearance agreements with various of our lending counterparties, and we are presently in a third forbearance plan, which extends to June 26th. As arduous as these forbearance agreements have been to negotiate and operate through, they have provided us with the time to manage our balance sheet and liquidity while also working to source third-party capital. And we are grateful to our lending counterparties that stuck with us through three versions of forbearance plans. During April and May, we significantly reduced our balance sheet in an effort to raise liquidity and delever. Importantly, because we entered into these forbearance plans, we were able to manage our balance sheet in a more judicious fashion given the time allowed through forbearance. Many of our asset sales 
particularly on mortgage-backed securities, were at prices significantly higher than the price levels that existed in late March. Our sales during the month of April alone of legacy non-agencies, CRTs, and MSR-related assets generated over $150 million of realized gains versus March 31 marks. Now, while still down significantly from values at the end of February, the patience permitted through forbearance enabled us to work hard to lessen book value erosion. We were also able to manage the sale of a large non-QM whole loan portfolio that traded in late April and closed in mid-May. While we realized a significant loss on this sale, we are confident that we achieved a much better execution by controlling and managing the trade than we would have realized had the lender just liquidated the pool. In the end, all of our lenders will have been fully repaid with no deficiencies, which is another of the design goals of a forbearance plan. It was clear to us in late March that our situation was not due to bad assets, but to fragile funding, and the path forward would require more durable forms of financing. We also recognize that term financing, margin holiday, and or non-mark-to-market financing would necessarily require higher haircuts and therefore more capital. Our method for seeking third-party capital began somewhat passively during the last week of March with fielding incoming indications of interest. As this process intensified with more and more parties, together with negotiating NDAs and then responding to voluminous data requests, all the while with our hair on fire negotiating a forbearance agreement while managing our balance sheet and liquidity, and we engaged Houlihan Loki at the end of March to manage this process for us. Initial indications of interest from a number of capital providers came back in mid-April, but as we continued to delever and raise liquidity, it became ev evident that our third-party capital needs had already changed. We extended our initial forbearance agreement at the end of April to June 1st, and as we entered May, we began to obtain better price discovery, particularly on our loan portfolio, which gave us more clarity as to our path forward. We sought a second round of proposals from third-party capital providers in mid-May, and as we held due diligence and informational calls with many of these institutions, we found that there was a competitive dynamic at work and a keen interest in pursuing a transaction with MFA. We signed a term sheet over Memorial Day weekend and have been working since to negotiate and document this agreement. For obvious reasons, we could not communicate publicly about these activities, and it was frustrating not to be able to provide the public disclosure and transparency on which we pride ourselves. We signed these agreements last night, and we're happy to announce today that we have entered into an agreement with Apollo and Athene, an insurance company affiliate of Apollo, to raise $500 million in the form of a senior secured note. But this $500 million note is only part of a holistic solution for MFA and a very strategic partnership with Apollo and Athene. Apollo and Athene together have arranged a committed term borrowing facility with Barclays of approximately $1.65 billion that includes over $500 million of participation from Athene. This term non-mark-to-market facility will provide us with durable financing for a large portion of our loan portfolio. In addition, Athene has committed to purchase, subject to certain pricing conditions, a portion of our first securitization of non-QM loans. And finally, Apollo and Athene are engaged with another of our lenders to structure an additional similar lending facility for our fix and flip portfolio, in which Athene also intends to participate. Pro forma for these facilities, approximately 60% of the company's financing will be in the form of non-mark-to-market funding, providing shareholders with significant downside protection in the event of future market volatility. We expect that upon closing and funding of these transactions, we'll be able to satisfy remaining margin calls, which were only $32 million as of June 12th, and exit from the current forbearance agreement on or before June 26th. We also anticipate using some of the proceeds to pay accumulated unpaid dividends on our Series B and C preferred stock issues. And finally, we expect that this transaction will provide us with substantial capital to once again begin to pursue attractive investment opportunities. 
As part of this transaction, Apollo and Athene will receive warrants to purchase MFA common stock at varying prices over a five-year period and will appoint a non-voting observer to our board of directors. Apollo and Athene have also committed to purchase the lesser of 4.9% or $50 million of MFA stock in the open market over the next 12 months. We are extremely excited about this transaction, which we consider to be much more than a capital raise and very much a strategic alliance. Details of the specific terms of the credit agreement are provided in an 8K that we filed this morning. Moving on to the financial results for the first quarter of 2020. As others have described before us, the first quarter of 2020 was literally a tale of two distinct and utterly different periods in time. January, February, and the first two weeks of March were very normal and a good start to the new year. In, and in only a few days, the financial markets and the mortgage market in particular completely collapsed. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, pricing dislocations for markets and residential mortgage assets was so extreme that liquidity evaporated. Prices of legacy non-agencies, which had not changed by more than three points in the last two to three years, were suddenly lower by 20 points. CRT securities dropped as much as 20 to 50 points, and MSR-related asset prices were lower by 20 to 30 points all in a few days. MFA received almost $800 million in margin calls during the weeks of March 16th and March 23rd, and over 600 of these were on mortgage-backed securities. In contrast, we received $7, $7 million of margin calls on these portfolios during the entire week of March 2nd and $37 million during the week of March 9th. And during the months of December, January, and February, we received a total of six margin calls, all related to factor changes with a total aggregate amount of $4 million. During those same three months, we initiated 10 reverse margin calls totaling $14 million, meaning we received net $10 million more from our lenders due to price increases. While we began selling assets during the week of March 16th, the dearth of liquidity made this difficult. We announced on March 24th that we had not met margin calls on March 23rd and that we had initiated forbearance discussions with our finance and counterparties. As we began these negotiations, we continued to sell assets to raise liquidity and reduce leverage. Our first quarter financial results were profoundly affected by realized losses, impairment losses, unrealized losses on loans accounted for at fair value, provisions for credit losses under the new CECL standard, and valuation adjustments on assets designated as held for sale and resulted in a loss of $914 million or $2.02 per share. Book value decreased to $4.34 per share at March 31st and economic book value decreased to $4.09 per share. Page nine of the earnings presentation provides detail of some of these items together with the additional information section of the presentation beginning on page 13. Steve Yard will be available to discuss the financial results from the first quarter during the question and answer session. I would now like to spend some time discussing balance sheet changes since March 31st and provide some perspective on what we envision after funding of the Apollo and Athene transaction and exit from forbearance. Page seven of the earnings deck shows portfolio activity from December 31st to March 31st and then again from March 31st to May 31st. As you can see from the pie charts, we have sold substantially all of our mortgage-backed securities, and our $6.6 .6 billion portfolio is approximately 94% whole loans. This should not be a surprise, as almost all of our portfolio growth and new acquisitions over the last two to three years has been in whole loans. Mortgage-backed securities are admittedly more liquid and were therefore easier to sell, but we saw improvement in securities pricing through April and May, whereas loan pricing changes were less defined and slower to occur, both on the way down and on the way back up. More importantly, it is more difficult to get non-market, non-mark-to-market financing on mortgage-backed securities than it is on loans due to certain regulatory issues. So the decision was relatively easy. We view loans as generally more attractive assets 
and than securities, and loans are more conducive to more durable financing arrangements. In rough numbers, our whole loan portfolio today is comprised of non-QM loans, 2.4 billion, loans at fair value, 1.2 billion, fix and flip loans, 850 million, uh, purchase credit impaired or, or reperforming loans, 660 million, single family rental, 500 million, season performing loans, 150 million, and REO or real estate owned of $375 million. Looking forward, we will finance a significant portion of this portfolio through term non-mark to market financing, including securitization. With the committed 1.65 billion and our, our existing securitizations of approximately $500 million, we will have over $2 billion of such financing. And as mentioned previously, we are working on a similar committed line with a fiend and another dealer for our fix and flip portfolio. We will continue to pursue securitization, particularly for non-QM loans. Spreads for AAA securities widened out from the 100 area, that's 100 over swaps in early March, to as wide as plus 400 at the depth of the crisis, but they've been slowly grinding tighter and are now back to mid-100 levels. We expect that following the closing and funding of these transactions, we will be able to declare and pay the accumulated dividends on our Series B and Series C preferred stock issues. As we have disclosed previously, the terms of the forbearance agreement prohibited payments of dividends on any equity interests, including preferred stock. Once the preferred stock dividends are current, we will no longer be prohibited from paying a common dividend. As far as the dividend on MFA's common stock, the Board of Directors will determine our dividend policy going forward. While we do not provide guidance as to expected future dividends, I will share several pertinent facts that will clearly be given consideration in framing dividend discussions with the Board. One, we presently have undistributed wheat taxable income from 2019 of five cents per share. In order to avoid paying corporate income tax, we are required to declare a dividend for this income prior to filing of our 2019 wheat tax return, which we do in October of this year, and pay such dividend before the end of the year. Two, Estimated wheat taxable income or ordinary income for the first quarter of 2020 is approximately 10 cents per share. In order to avoid paying a 4% excise tax on this amount, we are required to declare dividends in 2020 for at least 85% of our estimated 2020 wheat taxable income. And three, capital losses, again for tax purposes, generated from sales of residential mortgage assets to date in 2020 or carried forward and offset future capital gains. However, these capital losses do not offset ordinary REIT taxable income. While we cannot forecast ordinary REIT taxable income for the balance of 2020, any such income generated will be added to the 10 cents in the first quarter in determining the threshold necessary to avoid the 4% excise tax. Other brief updates. At June 12th, our unrestricted cash was $242 million. Um, book value as of May 31st, gap book value is estimated to have increased by approximately 2 to 3% versus March 31st. Economic book value is estimated to be flat versus March 31st. This is primarily because carrying value loan marks were lower in April than in March. And while we have seen some appreciation from April to May, the May loan marks for carrying value loans, which is what determines economic book value or the difference between gap and economic book value, those marks are still below the March marks. This concludes my prepared remarks. Stacey, would you please open up the lines for questions? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you have a question, press 1, then 0 on your touchtone phone, and you may remove yourself by repeating the 1-0 command. And our first question will go to Doug Harder with Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Um, can you just talk about the the non mark to market facility? Um, you know, how, I guess how should we think about the incremental cost? You know, to have that that uh, added protection of, of, of non mark to market. Sure, Doug. Thanks for the question. Um, so 
Without, yes, it is It is um, slightly more expensive, although it's not really that much more expensive. The, the bigger difference is the advanced uh, rates, as you can imagine, are lower. And, and so hence the reason for, um, you know, the reason for, for, for more capital and, and overall, you know, less leverage overall. Um, but, you know, without, without and, and we're still in the process of, of you know, negotiating a, um, a fix and flip line. So it's a little bit too early to, to, to give you exact spread levels. We will we'll definitely do that on the second quarter earnings call. Um, but like I say, they're, they're, not, they're not that much more expensive than, than what, we, what we used to pay. All right, thanks. And, and you mentioned in your prepared remarks that, that with this new capital, you might be able to take advantage of, of investment opportunities. Is there any way you could size, you know, how much, um, you know, kind of available liquidity you think you would have to, you know, to invest following, you know, kind of all the actions you've taken? Sure. Um, again, it's a little preliminary because, you know, there's, there's, um, this this probably you know this will likely fund at the at the end of towards the end of June when we uh, get to the end of the forbearance period, um, and some of that will be used to to pay down some of the existing repo lines. But you know, suffice to say, it'll be hundreds of millions of dollars. So um, you know, it'll be substantial dry powder uh, to look for new opportunities. All right, thank you, Greg. Sure. And we'll go to Stephen Laws with Raymond James. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Um, morning, Stephen. I, I guess we, good morning. Uh, to follow up on Doug's uh, question, you know, I think it, you commented during the prepared remark, 60% of the financing, once you pro forma for the, the new um, non-mark-to-market facility, will be non-mark-to-market. Leverage was 1.9. Is, is that about where you want to be? Do you see the leverage going down from here? Does it go up from here, given the shift in the – the risk around the financing, kind of how do you view uh, the, the optimal portfolio size here for the near term, either, you know, bigger, smaller, staying the same? Um, you know, I don't, I, I certainly don't think it needs to be any smaller than it is today. I think, you know, there's, there's room to increase it somewhat. I think, you know, the leverage number could, could increase somewhat for several reasons. We still have um, and will have a number of unencumbered assets, uh, which we, could add leverage to an example of those would be the REO portfolio, which you know right now are essentially 100% unencumbered. Um, the other is through securitization. You know, effectively we get higher levels of leverage through securitization, and you know because it's 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 termed out and it's non mark to market. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a different type of leverage. Um, so I you know I think it could take higher. Do I see it going back up to? You know, to three times where it was before, where you know we used to say that we were the lowest levered um, uh, mortgage rate in the space. Probably not, but certainly within the in the twos is is conceivable. Great, thanks for that color. And uh, you know, a couple of things around the the Apollo announcement. Uh, I saw the the filing, and uh, I assume uh, again a follow up, Doug. The financing facility. We'll get more clarity on pricing there on the new mon- uh, non marked market. I think it's expected to close January uh, 10 days from now. So um, is that when we'll see pricing or what will it be after that? I think what we probably do is, is, is endeavor to provide more clarity on, on our liability cost structure on the earnings call for the second quarter. You know, we'll have the, we'll have the uh, Apollo with theme numbers, obviously, at the end of June. Um, but some of the other financing may not completely be in place yet. So, you know we're we're moving as as fast as we can to solidify that we need to to renegotiate MRAs with our existing lenders for the for the post forbearance um, lending environment and so you know all that will come to will will come into place um, but at a, at a minimum we'll we'll provide much more robust disclosure on that cost structure on the um, second quarter earnings call and again keep in mind that. You know, none of those numbers will be reflected in in the second quarter, so they, they won't even begin to be reflected in financial results until the third quarter. Uh, okay, that's helpful to to think about that from timing. On the theme, uh, commitment to buying bonds and next securitization. Can you give us any color on on where the bonds are in the stack that they're committed to to look at, and um, when that securitization may come? I mean, you know, how should we think about the benefits uh, to MFA from that uh, that commitment? 
So I think the benefits are pretty substantial. Um, you know, they would they would typically be on the bonds below triple A's. Um, and as far as timing on that securitization, it, it's hard to say. Um, we were literally one or two days in March from pricing a securitization on non-QM loans. So, you know, suffice to say the, the, the pools and the loans are teed up to securitize. Um, so, you know, we're, we're going to move ahead with that as, as quickly as we can. Great. And, and last question, I think for me, uh, I uh, really appreciate the, the color around retaxable income and, and carry uh, spillover from last year and distribution uh, dates. Um, I guess the way I understand it is that while the losses on security sales can offset read ordinary income, the losses on the, the hedges and swaps can, since that's considered part of financing and, and can offset. Or, uh, ordinary income. So I guess uh, first, uh, am I correct with that statement? And, and if so, uh, you know, can you quantify, uh, I believe I wrote it down, I tried to, um, what the losses were on the unwind of the swaps. I think it was $170 million maybe that will be amortized in interest expense over 20 months, I believe. Is that all going to be able to offset ordinary income this year, or does it carry over next year as well? So it's a it's a good question. Unfortunately, I don't have Terry Myers on this call. Steve, I'm not sure if, if you know the answer to that, or maybe yeah. we, can, we can get back offline. Yeah, Craig, Craig, Steve's question is a good one. Um, I think we disclosed in the press release that as a result of the unwind of the 4.1 billion of swaps, we have roughly seven, I think it's 71 million of uh, losses that are currently trapped in OCI. And That's right. And so the, the you know right now if those the, the the liabilities that they were hedging for accounting purposes um, the, the swaps have a 20 month sort of average life so all things staying as they are right now though those losses would be recognised for accounting purposes over that period of time um, it's going to depend on assessment of whether those hedged items will. The probability of those hedge of those hedge items recurring in the future, and that will ultimately determine the timing of when those losses are recognised for gap accounting purposes, and also ultimately for tax. So, you know, based on how that assessment plays out, uh, you know, as we as we renegotiate financing, it could impact the timing of that. Um, so that you know, will be remain it will remain to be seen as to exactly when that those losses are recognised in gap income and taxable income. But right Great. now, if, not, if based on the assessment that we've done, it would be recognized over about a 20-month period. Okay. Right. Thanks for the color on that. I appreciate you taking my questions this morning. Thanks, Stephen. We'll go to Rick Shane with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. And thank you for all of the disclosure uh, and the timeline. It's very, it's very helpful. Um, I just want to understand the Apollo Warrant position a little bit better. Um, you know, typically we talk about warrants in terms of coverage. Uh, what is the coverage in the context of the $500 million facility? So it's disclosed in the um, in the 8K. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's basically two warrant packages, a total of um, 7.5%. Um, and the, the, the pricing was struck when the term sheet was signed, um, although coincidentally I think the blended – um, exercise price of the warrants is approximately equal to the to the 60-day VWAP of the stock. Got it. Okay, that that's helpful. And I did not see that in the AK. There's a ton of material <coughs> this morning, so I, I apologize for missing that. But that's helpful. Um, no worries. And then, uh, look, you know, you guys talk about the the <coughs> excuse me um, the strategic nature of the partnership. Uh, obviously, Apollo, from a funding and financing perspective, um, is a, a global leader. Um, they also, frankly, have some history in this space strategically. I'm curious if you see it really as more of a funding relationship or ultimately uh, more of a partnership in terms of asset gathering as well. Uh, I mean, frankly, I think it's probably both. I think... Um... You know, we, you've already seen with Athene that Athene has has leaned in to uh, to, to lend us money um, and to lend us, you know, attractive term non mark to market money. Um, there, 
you know, they're doing the same thing with another dealer on our fix and flip portfolio. They're, you know, purchasing subordinate bonds in securitizations that we do. Um, you know, I think, you know, Athene is, is obviously a, a buyer of mortgage assets. So I think we view it very much as a partnership. You know, within the Apollo complex, there's also an originator, a Mera home. So, uh, you know, I think it remains to be seen where all the possible um, synergies are. But, you know, we think it's, it's very much a strategic relationship and it's, it's, it's certainly more than just funding. Got it. Um, very helpful. Hey, guys, thank you very much. Thanks, Rick. And we'll go to Kenneth Lee with RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, you, you mentioned that over time you're expecting to, to finance more of the, the residential whole loans through securitizations. Wondering if you could just give us some color on the, on the current environment that, that you're seeing in terms of uh, securitizations. Thanks. Sure. Brian, you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, Actually, um, for recent times, there there has been you know a fair amount of demand for the senior part of the stack. You know, as, as Craig was mentioning in his prepared remarks, you saw spreads really widen out going into uh, March and April, but from May and, uh, and in, you've really seen sort of the return of of securitization, and now you're seeing sort of spreads on the the triple A's um, anywhere between you know 125 and 150 at the moment, uh, so there seems to be a lot of pent-up demand from the lack of issuance over that two-month period, and so, so there's a lot of uh, you know, demand for the security. So, so we're uh, you know the outlook on that, at, at least in the immediate near term, is is pretty positive. Great, thanks. And, and just one uh, one follow-up, uh, if I may. And it sounds like, you know, with, with the, the interim financing facility as, as well as the capital raise, uh, the, the liquidity position and the general resiliency of the, the company has been improved significantly. But wondering, you know, with uh, 60% of the, the portfolio, as you mentioned, now being financed through non-mark to market, um, is there any way you could just sort of like give us a, a sense or better yet frame how strong this liquidity position is? Um, in terms of being able to withstand any kind of potential uh, market volatility going forward. Thanks. Sure. Well, we think you know we think it's a it's a substantially um, more bulletproof um, financing structure. Um, you know, given additional liquidity and given the non-mark to market nature, um, you know, we think it's, it's very durable. Uh, to your to your point about the um, securitizations, I think as some of these securitizations occur those are loans that will go off those lines because they'll be part of the securitization. Um, and, you know, even at current levels, which are, you know, 25 or maybe 30 basis points wider than, than where they were in early March, um, they're still very attractive levels given how low uh, swap rates are. Um, so I think, and, and obviously the securitization is completely non-recourse, non-mark to market. So I think, you know, we're in a, a substantially uh, better situation. Also keep in mind that, as I said, there were, there were 800 million of margin calls over a two-week period, and 600 million of that was mortgage-backed securities. And our mortgage-backed securities, you know, portfolio at this point is, is very small. So, it, you know, it really was the securities portfolio, ironically, that caused so much of the pain um, rather than the loans. And, and, yes, the loans did decline in value, but the loan – Value decline happened over a much longer period of time, and it was and it was nowhere near as deep as the securities um, uh, value declines. Great, that's very helpful. Appreciate it, and thank you very much. You bet. And once again, if you have a question, press one then zero, and we'll go to Eric Hagen with KBW. Please go ahead. Uh, hey, thanks. Good morning, guys, and uh, hope you're hope you're all doing well. Um, Morning, Eric. What's the good morning? What's uh, can you just tell us the amount of unrealized loss that's remaining in the portfolio now, and how much of that do you, I guess do you think can be recovered? I mean, how much of how much of those marks on the loan side are due to things like liquidity that aren't necessarily credit related uh, or explicitly credit related and could be recovered? Sure, good question, Steve. You want to um, you want to tackle that? Sure, Craig. Um, so. On the carrying value loans, 
which you know impacts our economic book value. The losses on those, you know, at at, current, at the current position at the end of May, um, they're in an unrealized loss position of roughly 160 million dollars. And you know, to the extent that um, prices you know, continue to recover, you know, it's hard to say how much they could recover you know, due to liquidity or whatnot. But this, as an example, if there was a one one point increase in pricing across that portfolio that would you know that would reduce those losses by roughly 50 million dollars um, and similarly on the security side because of the way we did the accounting on the CRT securities and the MSR notes by you know we were selling those securities and we impaired those securities and adjusted the amortized cost at the end of March um, if, if, if there's you know increases in increases in those prices again hard to suggest how much that might be but as just an example if they were to revert to par over time there would be you know a fairly substantial impact on our on our book value as much as you know, 70 million dollars if they were to revert to par so that would have a an increase a you know a significant increase impact as well so hard to say exactly you know how much how much recovery could occur but um, there could certainly be some um, uplift in the book value as a result of continued recovery in those prices. And Steve, what okay, about loan loss reserves? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's the other thing. I mean, obviously, it, it, we applied CESL, um in the first quarter for the first time, probably the worst possible timing to apply an accounting standard that was really based on projection of future losses. So, you know, we, we obviously took some significant um, reserves on our carrying value portfolios. And you know, we, we used, I think, you know, prudently uh, conservative assumptions. The social reserve is sort of heavily dependent on macroeconomic factors like unemployment and HPA. And, you know, we, we have roughly, um, you know, $140 million of, 140 to $150 million of CECL reserves. So, you know, if our assumptions are, you know, are a little too conservative, perhaps. I don't know if they will be or they won't be. It'll depend over time how things progress. But that's another area where there could be some, um, you know, some potential uplift in uh, gap book value moving forward. Got it. That's uh, that's helpful detail. Hey, I'm I'm wondering how you guys are thinking about the shape of the capital structure here. Um, I think the intention when you guys raised the preferred in February was to retire the baby bond and maybe some of the press or maybe I have that backwards, but I mean, what's the plan here? Um, is there still some capacity to, to be able to do that or just your overall thoughts on, I guess, the shape of the capital structure? So I, I think, you know, we're, we're pretty happy with this, with the shape of the capital structure. I think, you know, the timing of that, of that series C was such that, um, you know, the world changed very quickly in the course of a few days. Um, and so we, you know, we did not end up call, calling the, the baby bond. So I think, you know, we'll, we'll look at that over time, but like I say, we're not unhappy with our capital structure at this point. I don't think it's, you know, overly heavily weighted towards, you know, preferred certainly. Um, so we'll, we'll just sort of, you know, take it quarter by quarter and see. Okay. And I know that there's a lot of, I guess, feels like there's moving pieces with the various facilities and what you guys are on the brink of, um, it sounds like, uh, obtaining. And, and, and I know that 40% of the, the, the funding book will be repo, but can you give us detail on what assets that repo will be funding and what's the terms? I mean, is there any risk that that doesn't roll and are they all still uh, daily mark to market? Um, on that remainder, that remaining repo. So there's, there's, you know, there's always danger that that repo won't roll. Although, you know, we have, we're down to six counterparties in the current forbearance plan, and suffice to say, you know, we're we're very familiar with all six of them, and, and have had, you know, many discussions with them about this. I think, you know, to give you an example, I think some of the and, and some of the way that we create a little bit more durable financing on, let's say, loans, for instance, is even if it is a daily mark to market, if the if the permitted advance rate is, let's say, 70 percent, which which is probably lower than it used to be. But let's say the permitted advance rate is 70 percent. Um, if we if we instead of borrowing 70 percent, if we borrow 65 or even 60 percent, 
it creates a little bit of a margin holiday in that the you know the price of the of the loans could decline, but it wouldn't generate a margin call until you until you actually um, you know made up the difference between the actual borrowing rate and the advance rate. So that's one way to create you know slightly more durable financing uh, out of daily mark to market um, financing. Right. Can I can I press you for where that repo is going to be? Um sitting and what it's going to be funding? I mean, it sounds like maybe the non-QM has committed funding at this point. But where I guess what I'm asking is, where are you, where are you, uh, where are you still trying to tie up some potential term funding? I mean, what are you not able to get term funding on, potentially? Uh, I, I mean, you know, we can get term funding. It's just a question of we have, we have more loans than we have term funding. So we just have to figure out how to allocate. So I think a substantial portion of non-QM will be uh, termed out non mark to market, but a substantial portion will be more traditional as well. Um, okay. I think, you know, as I mentioned, the, the goal is to, to, um, to put this facility in place for fix and flip, which will be uh, term non mark to market, and that would be for that whole portfolio. Um, the, you know, the rest of the loan portfolio is, is spread around. I think more of the non performing loans are better suited to the, um, the existing facility with Barclays and Athene. Um, but as far as reperforming and season performing, you know, they're all, they're all somewhat fungible. Okay. And there's flexibility for what you guys can pledge on the line with Apollo and Athene and Barclays? Yeah. Or, is it, yeah. or is it pretty yeah. strict? Yeah. Okay. It does, no, it's, it doesn't mean that we can pledge everything, but there's a fair amount of flexibility. Got it. Hey, thanks for the comments. Appreciate it. Sure. And we'll go to Steve Delaney with JMP Securities. Please go ahead. Thanks. Hey, good morning, everyone, and sorry to be late getting in the queue. I'm, I had the code wrong. So uh, first, just congratulations on the refi package. Um, two points there, strong strategic partners, and by air mouth, it looked like the uh, dilution from the warrants was, was far less than we've seen in some uh, some other financing. So great job on that. Thanks. Um, Craig, you. Are, can you, I guess eventually we'll see this, but just quickly trying to run through the 8K, I didn't see a reference to the rate index or, or what you'd be paying on these two facilities, the uh, the 500 senior secured and the uh, the uh, borrowing facility. Could you let us know what the uh, payment uh, terms are on those facilities? Sure, Steve. Thanks for the question, and good to finally talk to you again. Um, yeah. So we we talked about this earlier in the call. We'll we're we we'll report more robustly on the cost structure of our liability structure when we report our, our second quarter earnings. Um, okay. It's not in the 8K, so don't kill yourself looking for it. Okay, um, I stopped after a few minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but as I said to another question earlier on the call, you know, it is it is somewhat more expensive than than what we used to pay for financing, but it's not, it's not that much more expensive. It's the, you know, the advance rates on, on more durable financing are obviously lower. And so the implications are that, um, that, you know, overall leverage numbers, even though we thought our leverage was pretty low before, uh, will probably be somewhat lower. So I, I guided to the, to the, somewhere in the twos earlier, in, in yes. terms of, you know, sort of target future leverage. All right, that's helpful, and we'll keep an eye out for that. We can we can certainly plug something in, you know, in the model update for now. And I, I listened closely to your comments um, about the tax situation and the uh, the dividends. And just given where you are with uh, trying to clean up, you know, the forbearance and catch up on the prefs, you know, it's it struck me that you know you, the the me- message you were sending is that the board certainly um, intends to to reestablish a common dividend. In fact, you you likely will be required to. But my read on it is, and it, it, what I think I'm going to advise clients that ask is, you know, it, look forward maybe to three Q. Um, in the second half of the year, as far as the reestablishment and let the comp- for a common payout and let the company completely clean up their repositioning, um, and that's I'm just sharing, that's the way I think I, I heard your comments. And you didn't say that specifically that there would be no two Q common, but it seems you know more likely to me that it makes more sense in the in the third quarter. Again, I, you're right. I I didn't say that specifically, but um, 
but I think you know your 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 comment is is probably well founded. Okay, great. Well, listen, congrats. I know it's been a brutal brutal three months, but uh, congratulations on getting through it, and we'll all live to fight another day. Thanks a lot, Steve. Good to talk to you. Take care, guys. All right, bye bye. And at this time, there are no questions. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Stacey. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. We look forward to um, to speaking with you again uh, fairly soon in early August to talk about the uh, second quarter. Thanks again. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That does conclude your conference for today. Thank you for your participation and for using AT&T Teleconference Service. You may now disconnect.